so close. We only have two maybe chapters one, left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one more class, maybe, or yeah, two. Perhaps, uh, not that much left, but, and we're coming to the moment now where it's just, everything's just wrapping up. You know, there's now Yoga Nandaji, this chapter today is 47. I return to the West. And now he's finished everything. He's going back home, or at least to the home he's created. And so we'll just get to have fun with him and see the joy of returning back after such a long voyage to his loved ones. Um, let's start this class with this chant. This is rise in freedom. Nothing on earth can hold me. Rise, O oh my soul, in freedom. Rise, O oh my soul, in freedom. Nothing to fear anymore. Let's affirm together with this chant.
what a joy is to just keep walking Yogananda's journey to go through his experiences and to live what he lived by hearing all his stories, by all the memories he shared. And the blessing to have this holy book that we can get back to it again and again whenever we need inspiration, guidance, relaxation, and attunement with the Great Ones. Let's open ourselves to the grace of Yoganandaji, his wisdom, his love for God, and his generous spirit of sharing everything he learned and what he was blessed by. And be able now to be blessed ourselves by it as well. Let's turn to page 455, if you have been following along with your own book. This is chapter 47, I Return to the West. Now, Yoganandaji has been away for almost two years, a year and a half at least, uh, you know, a little longer perhaps. And he's been everywhere, hasn't he? All of Europe, uh, then of course in India, and now he's back. And on his way back, as he made that promise, he stops in London, and this is where our chapter begins. I have given many yoga lessons in India and America, but I must confess that as a Hindu, I am unusually happy to be conducting a class for English students. My London class members laughed appreciatively. No political turmoils ever disturbed our yoga peace. Now, of course, this is the 1930s, <laughs> England rules India, we are under the British Raj, and so for Yoganandaji to be there in London now, and to share these yoga principles with the British nationals and citizens is uh, you know, a touch paradoxical, but of course, there is no paradox in love of God, and so Yoganandaji is humorously enjoying his time in London. India was now a hallowed memory. It is September 1936, and I am in England to fulfill a promise given 16 months earlier to lecture again in London. The English tenacity has admirable expression in a spiritual relationship. The London yoga students loyally organized themselves after my departure into a self-realization fellowship center, holding their meditation meetings weekly throughout the bitter war years. So 1936 is also, you know, uh, a tumultuous period, or at least the start of a tumultuous period. Uh, Hitler's just become the head of Germany. And even from 1936 and just a couple of years earlier, he'd already started annexing parts of Europe. And he went into, you know, took over Austria, Czechoslovakia. He wanted to go into Poland. And all this while the other countries, primarily Britain and France, they've been kind of watching what's going on, they're trying to give him a lot of room just to make sure that nobody gets provoked and it doesn't lead to another war. But of course, we know that it does. And so it's nice to see that these people who've at least received something, <laughs> you know, powerful for themselves, now can come together, have satsang. It would be an interesting thing for us to think, if we're in the middle of some major calamity, would we be all coming together and connecting or not? <laughs> would we be hiding? Would we be running? 
because you know they didn't london was not spared at all it was constantly being bombed throughout the world war so imagine for these people to still come together weekly despite that to have their sadhanas to have their satsangs together i mean that's the kind of you know impressive dedication uh, the spiritual path requires unforgettable weeks in england days of sightseeing in london and then over to the beautiful countryside master always enjoyed to see yeah, everything sure, that he could yeah. he never <laughs> missed an opportunity to enjoy the beauties of this world mr right and i summoned the trusty ford to visit the birthplaces and tombs of the great poets and heroes of british history an interesting side note which he doesn't mention here is that yogananda himself in a previous incarnation was william the conqueror he was um, well we call him a british king but actually he wasn't a british king he was french he was from normandy and he was he came over to england and conquered england hence the name william the conqueror so he's somewhat of a british villain they don't look upon him very kindly but uh, an interesting fact i'm sure he went and visited all of william's places as well and was remembering oh yeah this is where i did this and this is where i did that it's swami ji said that he was the one who created the english speaking language yeah or... there were some very interesting um, elements to william the conqueror's life that a he united england in a way that it never was until that time it was england was primarily broken into you know noble families barons chiefdoms and they all more or less functioned cohesively but they also were very antagonistic to one another everybody was trying to just kind of increase their own you know property increase their own power but when william came and conquered england he was the united. first to unite a all of them into what became england became a one contiguous country he also i think began the early formations of what eventually became the parliamentary system where the in you know the king was there but also others had a say and he created a council and so you know he put into things that didn't exist prior to that it was just the emperor's word was final nobody else get, got to really participate in the governance of the country whereas over here he created you can say almost the seeds of what became the democratic process to a certain mm -hmm. degree uh, he also indeed though he mm -hmm. spoke french uh, and you know back then the i don't know what the british language was but it would much some sort of a celtic you know gaelic i don't know uh, dialect but he started the process at least i don't know how mm -hmm. that must have come about of eventually kind of creating and uniting the country also in one language which became the english language and it's no sorry, you finish it. no no you finish? i'll i'll fin i'll add when you finish your okay. thought okay i was just saying it's interesting because you think of a great master like yogananda or any great soul because he came as william the conqueror already a freed soul not you know not like oh i'm still working out my karma and therefore but this is not a role we would think of a uh, self realized master should choose you know like a king of in, involved in bloody war and not even particularly then espousing some great spiritual truths just all right my job is now to form a country to form a language to form a governance system but then when we look at england centuries later it then conquers more than half of the world spreads its language <laughs> spreads its governing systems spreads the way that it has you know so everything that william the conqueror you can say almost started and instituted eventually spread to the whole world leading to a greater unity of the world leading to the globalization that we experience now because everywhere english is the common language every in the majority of the world the democratic process is looked upon as at least right now the most you know uh i mean most convenient but perhaps also the most right and appropriate for this day and age and so it's interesting how these masters don't just come for oh you know they are dhyan karo meditate karo they also have to come and redirect just civilizations and how history is going to function how people are going to so yogananda has to come in the 1100 so that somewhere in the 1900s the world looks like the way the masters are wanting it to look and it's just a interesting thought mm -hmm. in fact for any of you who are interested in past lives there is a fascinating <laughs> book 
that one of our devotees wrote several years ago, in fact, uh, guided by Swami Kriyananda, he asked her to do research about this. And the book is called Four Lives, Two Souls. And it's the similarities for all of you who are familiar with Yogananda's mission and his teachings and want to know a little bit more of his previous incarnations. This is a fascinating book where there is, you can see the, not just the personality traits, the comparison between William the Conqueror and Yogananda, but, but their mission and how their divine power was reflected then in that incarnation and how God was using Yogananda in this more actual incarnation. And of course, it speaks a little bit of uh, William the Conqueror descendant and Yogananda's legacy in the form of his disciples. And of course, Swami Kriyananda is part somehow of that book as well. But, but for all of you who want to know a little bit more in depth about Yogananda's previous incarnation, this book is really fascinated, fascinating and a lot of years of research uh, have been done in order to put this book together. It's very accurate, and dates, and I mean, everything is just, just very- A lot of historical lo facts. historical And then parallels events. drawn. Yes, parallels, yes. Very nice. Oh. Our little party sailed from South Southampton, from Southampton for America in late October on the Bremen. The, the majestic Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor brought a joyous emotional gulp, not only to the throats of Miss Belch and Mr. Wright, but to my own. The Ford, a bit battered from struggles <laughs> in ancient soils, was still puissant. It now took in its stride the transcontinental trip to California in late 1936, low Mount Washington. So now they had to drive all the way from New York in the mm -hmm. west, east coast all the way down to California in the west coast, which if you've been anywhere in America, it's a huge country. <laughs> it takes its own sweet time to get from one space to the other. The year-end holidays are celebrated annually at the Los Angeles Center with an eight-hour group meditation on December 24th, the spiritual Christmas, followed the next day by a banquet of social Christmas. The festivities this year were augmented by the presence of dear friends and students from distant cities who had arrived to welcome home the three world travelers. This is a tradition that we continue until this day of uh, having that eight hour meditation. Our Guru's spiritual Christmas is now, no matter who you are, what your religion is, what your intentions are. You know, just before uh, Christmas on the 25th of December, any time before. In India, we have to look for a weekend before. Um, we always have that eight-hour meditation and something that it feels very nice to be able to continue that tradition down from him. The Christmas Day feast included delicacies brought 15,000 miles for this glad occasion. Gucci mushrooms from Kashmir, canned rasgulla, <laughs> and mango pulp. I was thinking, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those, I have all those cans and they are heavy. So I'm sure he didn't bring just one. one. <laughs> just one. I mean, it's just like, wow. Papar <laughs> uh, <papad> biscuits. <laughs> and an oil of the Indian kiura. I don't know what the kiura. Kiura flower, which flavored our ice cream. The evening found us grouped around a huge sparkling Christmas tree, the nearby fireplace crackling with logs of aromatic cypress. But just one moment, I mean, <laughs> here, how, how beautiful is this? I mean, not just only Yogananda wanting to bring the essence, the spice of India <laughs> through these particular items that he considered almost, you know, what represent the cuisine in <laughs> India or the highlights of India, but the fact that all this was happening during Christmas, you know, like the East and the West, 
celebrating together, you know, all these disciples and the energy that he brought from India was able to give it all and to add it all in the name of Christ and he that was representing Hinduism. So I think it, it makes this exchange of gifts and energy and the timing of it even much more special because I'm sure that a, a vibrational level, uh, he was fulfilling his mission. Mm. And this is why he came to unite East and West. And we can see here that moment happen, was already happening, that, that unity. And, and I consider this moment like very Sweet. and sacred mm. as well, because he was doing it so superficially, so fun, so joyous. But this is why he incarnated for this moment, to bring that unity between the two worlds, the two almost Hops. consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Gift time. Presence from the Earth's far corners. Palestine, Egypt, India, England, France, Italy. How laboriously, this is where you get to know, had Mr. Wright counted the trunks at each foreign junction that no pilfering hand received the treasures intended for loved ones in America. How many trunks must have grown? <laughs> <laughs> day by day, I, I, I space by space. I can imagine really master being so peculiar. And don't forget this and don't forget that. And <laughs> did you put that? And did you can? Did you write the name? You know, like it. It. I think master <laughs> had that practical mind that he knew everything about <laughs> everyone and every little gift that he bought for particular disciples. So it was, it was important that those trunks would be. <laughs> Safe. Safe. <laughs> Plaques of the sacred olive tree from the Holy Land. Delicate laces and embroideries from Belgium and Holland. Persian carpets, finely woven Kashmiri shawls. Everlasting fragrant sandalwood trays from Mysore. The Shiva's bull's eye stones from central provinces. Old Indian coins of dynasties long fled, bejeweled vase, vases and cups, miniatures, tapestries, temple incense and perfumes, Swadeshi cotton prints, lacquer work, Mysore eye, ivory carvings, Persian slippers, <laughs> uh, quaint old illuminated manuscripts, velvets, brocades, Gandhi caps, <laughs> so sweet. I can think of all the, there's a photo of uh, Rajar Raja Sijanakananda wearing a Gandhi cap. <laughs> Potteries, tiles, brassworks, prayer rugs, booty of three continents. So much he must have carried, my goodness, and how many people would have gathered and, you know, it would have been awkward if they were not enough for everyone. <laughs> One by one, I distributed the gaily wrapped packages from the immense pile under the tree. Sister Gyana Mata, I handed a long box to the saintly American lady of sweet visage and deep realization, who during my absence had been in charge of Mount Washington. From the paper tissues, she lifted a sari of golden Benares silk. Thank you, sir. It brings the pageant of India before my eyes. Mr. Dickinson, the next parcel contained a gift which I had brought, bought in a Calcutta bazaar. Mr. Dickinson will like this, I had thought at the time. A dearly beloved disciple, Mr. Dickinson, had been present at every Christmas festivity since the founding of Mount Washington in 1925. At this 11th annual celebration, he was standing before me untying the ribbons of this little square package. The silver cup. Struggling with emotion, he stared at the present, a tall drinking cup. He seated himself some distance away, apparently in a daze. Mr. Dickinson and I were chatting together sometime later. Sir, he said, please let me thank you now for the silver cup. I could not find any words on Christmas night. 
Oh, I brought this gift especially for you. For 43 years, I have been waiting for that silver cup. It is a long story and one I have kept hidden within me. Mr. Dickinson looked at me shyly. The beginning was dramatic. I was drowning. My older brother had playfully pushed me into a 15-foot pool in a small town in Nebraska. I was only five years old then. As I was about to sink for the second time underwater, a dazzling multicolored light appeared, filling all space. In the midst was the figure of a man with tranquil eyes and a reassuring smile. My body was sinking for the third time when one of my brother's companions bent a tall slender willow tree in such a low dip that I could grasp it with my desperate fingers. The boys lifted me to the bank and successfully gave me first aid treatment. Twelve years later, a youth of 17, I visited Chicago with my mother. It was 1893. The great world parliament of religions was in session. Mother and I were walking down a main street when again I saw the mighty flash of light. A few paces away, strolling leisurely along, was the same man I had seen years before in vision. He approached a large auditorium and vanished within the door. Mother, I cried, that was the man who appeared at the time I was drowning. She and I hastened into the building. The man was seated on a lecture platform. We soon learned that he was Swami Vivekananda of India. After he had given a soul-stirring talk, I went forward to meet him. He smiled on me graciously, as though we were old friends. I was so young that I did not know how to give expression to my feelings, but in my heart I was hoping that he would offer to be my teacher. He read my thought. No, my son, I am not your guru. Vivekananda gazed with his beautiful piercing eyes deep into my own. Your teacher will come later, and he will give you a silver cup. After a little pause, he added smilingly, He will pour out to you more blessings than you are now able to hold. I left Chicago in a few days, Mr. Dickinson went on, and never saw the great Vivekananda again. But every word he had uttered was indelibly written on my inmost consciousness. Years passed. No teacher appeared. One night in 1925, I prayed deeply that the Lord would send me my guru. A few hours later, I was awakened from sleep by soft strains of melody. A band of celestial beings carrying flutes and other instruments came before my view. After filling the air with glorious music, the angels slowly vanished. The next evening, I attended for the first time, one of your lectures here in Los Angeles, and knew then that my prayer had been granted. We smiled at each other in silence. For 11 years now, I have been your Kriya Yoga disciple, Mr. Dickinson continued. Sometimes I wondered about the silver cup. I had almost persuaded myself that Vivekananda's words were only metaphorical. But on Christmas night, as you handed me the square box by the tree, I saw for the third time in my life the same dazzling flash of light. In another minute, I was gazing on my Guru's gift, which Vivekananda had foreseen for me 43 years earlier, a silver cup. Such a beautiful little story, isn't it? <clears throat> Many little interesting elements are present in this story. One of which, of course, is, you know, for me, if somebody said, you know, your guru will give you, somebody who is your teacher will give you a silver cup, for all my life, I'd just be looking for, you know, where's the silver cup, where's the silver cup? And, you know, everybody asks us, we've been having a discipleship class going on for the, you know, just the more, most recent group. And one of the main questions that comes is, how do you know who is your guru? You know, how can you know for a certainty? 
and you know, and they ask us obviously like how did you know that you know yogananda was your guru and it was just like you know, it's a feeling but there's no you know we can't just kind of say oh absolutely there's no doubt there's no, there's no doubt in our hearts but there's no real kind of clarity of awareness that i can say oh this makes me believe that he is my guru it's just really a feeling but if somebody were to give you something so concrete and say oh this is a silver cup and you know this is what will determine then that's what you will be looking for oh i'm looking for this silver cup and it's very nice to see that this man mr dickinson being able to accept yogananda ji as his guru and even without i mean he had to wait 11 years until it became obvious from vivekananda's prediction perspective that oh yeah yogananda is his guru but you know it was just very sweet that he didn't use oh no no he can't be my guru because I, he hasn't yet given me a silver cup and so therefore i'm still just looking and it's very sweet to know that it's really in the heart that relationship it's not you know the silver cup is just uh, a nice little masala of this story but in no way determines their relationship between guru and disciple and it's important to always have that you'll never know until you truly open yourself completely to the guru only then will we eventually you know we're still trying to figure this relationship out it's not it's such a it's such a subtle relationship and we're still working on another thought makes me feel that mr dickinson wasn't you know it took him 11 years to actually become a disciple <laughs> because even though we've taken discipleship it takes years to actually put ourselves in that space where finally the guru can actually even give us because you could be living with him for 20 years and still have not actually received from him what you've come to receive from him and it's just a uh just reading this story is such a both reassuring but also it speaks very highly of mr dickinson in in terms of him not being influenced by oh if the silver cup is in there that means he can't be my guru but he went immediately by how he knew he felt what he was receiving from the guru and then when the silver cup came years later only just as a confirmation but not as the deciding factor of what created their relationship in the first place yeah and the fact that it takes time to receive a realization of sorts or or a blessing that you can really integrate in a deeper aspect of your being it just it just takes time as as disciple to really value what your guru has to give you because it, there is a point on the path that we just keep taking for granted what we have even to have a guru sometimes i take it for granted i take it like yeah it's a given i have a guru and i have these teachings and i have kriya yoga and we just we are not able to to acknowledge the grandiosity of what that means I mean to to go through a difficult time and know you have a place to go. Know you have an an anchor that you can hold yourself on. And and that's not the majority has that. But as disciples we do. And and I think it, it's it takes time for us to to even appreciate the value of having a constant guidance in our lives constantly he never leaves our side and brings me to this other point of this story mr dickinson since he was a child in moments of fear or a difficult period he only recognized a light around him who saved him who protected him and that's the only thing he had time went by and another difficult period of his life life again that light was there to guide him to save him and now when he had that incredible moment with his guru again that light only then he could make a um 
um, connection. connection between what saved him and protected him before to now the form and the knowledge it was his guru. So for me, and I think this is something to think about and introspect, how many times in our lives, whether we were aware or not of the presence of our guru, whether we knew even we had a guru, he was already protecting us. If you look back and look into your life, those moments that were difficult, even before you knew you had a guru, he was already protecting you. He was already preventing you from doing something. He was taking away something from you that you didn't need it. And, and all of us, all of us, have that in our lives. So I, th I think it's, it's good for us to look back into our lives and, and appreciate those moments where now in retrospect, we, we can see we were prevented and saved from perhaps a horrible karma or from death, death or from you know, an action that could have created many you know, consequences. So yes, we all have that light around us. And sometimes, yes, it comes in the form of the guru later on, but, but it's there daily, daily <laughs> around us. So it will be good to see if we can tune into it more often than not. Also to have to wait that long was <laughs> <laughs> such a, must have been a hard thing for Mr. Dickinson to be waiting all those decades, but, you know, just being so sure that it's about to come, it's about to happen. <clears throat> well, we just finished chapter 47, we're off to chapter 48. Now in the original 1946 version, this is the last chapter, but then in 1952, just before Yoganandaji's passing, he added a final chapter, which were the years 1940 to 1951. So we'll just go through this 48th chapter. It is at Encinitas in California. A surprise, sir, during your absence abroad, we have had, we have had this Encinitas hermitage built. It is a welcome home gift. Sister Gyanamata smilingly led me through a gate and up a tree-shaded walk. If any of you have ever been to any of the places of Yoganandaji's in California, um, perhaps you visited Encinitas. It's such a beautiful place, just on the ocean, on a cliff. I mean, it's one of those just uh, magnificent properties that <laughs> God has bestowed upon our Guru. It's also one, if you remember, years earlier in his guru's hermitage as a young boy, when Sri Yukteswarji told Yogananda, you're not paying attention to me. And then Yogananda Ji says, you know, ask me whatever you said, Guruji, and I'll just tell you immediately what you said. He's like, well, it's not about you being able to repeat what I said. In your mind, you're building three hermitages or ashrams or something. And he describes, of course, one of them being Mount Washington. One was the Ranchi school. And he says, a seaside hermitage. And up till this point, Yoganandaji never had one. And so now comes Encinitas in 19. I was thinking as well, no, that so beautiful as disciples. What do they do when the Guru leaves? Hmm. They get busy <laughs> for him to offer something when he returns. And, and a group of them just come come with the inspiration, with the financial support, with the enthusiasm, with the, I mean, it, it's just like, and I'm talking about some of these disciples, Sister Yanamata, she was in her 70s. But, but the concept of the Guru is not here yet, that's not an impediment for me to keep building something, not just for him, something that thousands of people will come later on to feel my guru's presence. And, and I thought that was a wonderful way that as disciples, they just were guided to. And if we think how this, apply, this applies to us nowadays, 
the guru is not here anymore. <laughs> Swami Kriyananda is not here anymore. He's just maybe traveling somewhere. Are we getting busy for his work? And anyway, I thought that last night made me think like that's, that's the attitude, that remarkable concept like, okay, he will be gone, but I'm not going to waste my time. I want to have something to offer him. And in his absence, I'll, I'll work on it. I'll, I'll just, and then I will present it to him. For some of us, we will only be able to do that at the end of our lives <laughs> because, you know, we will only be able to do so much. But, but the thought of it really inspired me yesterday when I was reading. Yogananda Ji would tell some, some of his disciples, I believe, that, you know, when I come back, will I, you know, recognize this work? And he would say sometimes, I don't know if jokingly or <laughs> what he said, at times I will come incognito. And while you're giving a class or you're doing, giving a satsang, I'll sit in the back. <laughs> and you won't know who I am, but I'll know who you are. And every now and then you're always wondering, <laughs> oh, this new person who just walked in, I hope he's not the guru trying to check in on us and see how we're doing. But yeah, he's always going to come back. Is it already 200 years? No, he said he'd kind of slip in every now and then too. I don't think, I don't know if he means only after 200 years, but um, the point being, as Narayani said, is that uh, we're building also for when he comes back. So he's going to keep coming back to see what's happening. You know, <laughs> how are these, how are the kids doing in the absence of the parents? And for other disciples as well. No, I, when I went to Encinitas for the first time, I was like, so, I mean, you could really feel the presence of Yogananda, and that's something that he didn't even build, were his disciples. And many of us, through Ananda, we feel so strongly Master, and Master didn't even build it. It was a direct disciple. So it's like each one of us eventually will, will, will have that responsibility, and the blessings and the power and the inspiration will be bestowed on us in order to, to offer that as our gift to the Guru for other disciples that will come. I mean, it's like the legacy continues. It's like never end, like a father to a child and then the grandson. You know, it's like it, that's the legacy that is given to us and the responsibility each one of us can leave something behind for somebody else to benefit from the good karma of the Guru through your inspiration. Encinitas is also where the autobiography of a yogi was written, so it's a, a very special place from that perspective as well. I saw a building jutting out like a great white ocean liner toward the blue brine, first speechlessly, then with oohs and ahs. And finally, with man's insufficient vocabulary of joy and gratitude, I examined the ashram. Sixteen unusually large rooms, each one charmingly appointed. The stately central hall with immense high ceiling windows looks out on a united altar of grass, ocean and sky. A symphony in emerald, opal and sapphire. A mantle over the huge of the hall's huge fireplace holds the framed likeness of Lahiri Mahashaya, smiling his blessing over this far Pacific heaven. Directly below the hall, built into the very bluff, two solitary meditation caves confront the infinities of sky and sea. Verandas, sun-bathing nooks, acres of orchard, a eucalypti grove, flagstone paths leading through roses and lilies to quiet arbors, a long flight of stairs ending on an isolated beach and the vast ocean and the vast waters was dream ever more concrete. May the, go may the good and heroic and bountiful souls of the saints come here, reads a prayer for a dwelling from the Zend Avasta fastened onto one of the hermitage doors. 
And may they go hand in hand with us, giving the healing virtues of their blessed gifts, as widespread as the earth, as far-flung as the rivers, as high-reaching as the sun, for the furtherance of better men, for the increase of abundance and glory. May obedience conquer disobedience within this house. May peace triumph here over discord, free-hearted giving over avarice, truthful speech over deceit, reverence over contempt. That our minds be delighted and our souls uplifted. Let our bodies be glorified as well. O light divine, may we see thee, and may we approaching come around about thee, and attain and attain unto thine entire companionship. Zen the Vast, I believe, is the scripture of the Zoroastrians, and so it's just sweet that they put this entire little section above the hermitage walls. The Self-Realization Fellowship had been made possible through the generosity the Self-Realization Fellowship Ashram, sorry, had been made possible through the generosity of a few American disciples, American businessmen of endless responsibilities who yet find time daily for their Kriya Yoga. Not a word of the hermitage construction had been allowed to reach me during my stay in India and Europe. Astonishment, delight. How sweet for these mm. disciples to <laughs> must have been like in their hearts like oh should we just mention something to him and you know because there, there was a lot of correspondence back and forth and back then it was all through letters I mean imagine how long that would have taken but we've you've, we've got several collection of letters between Yogananda ji and yeah, uh, Gyana Mata ji between Rajar C. Janakananda who was his successor you know, and just and not even one mention that we're planning anything, thinking anything. I mean, it's hard to believe <laughs> knowing that you are dealing with a self-realized master <laughs> that knows every thought you think. <laughs> but maybe, you know, God prevent, you know, remove that perhaps, you know, thought. Well, he's, he's playing his but the play. So it, he... it feels that he was really <laughs> astonished by it. During my earlier years in America, I had combed the coast of California in quest of a small site for a seaside ashram. Whenever I had found a suitable location, some obstacle had invariably arisen to thwart me. Gazing now over the broad acres of Encinitas, humbly I saw the effortless fulfillment of Sri Yukteswar's long ago prophecy, a hermitage by the ocean. It's also an interesting point to contemplate, isn't it? Uh, you know, we keep saying self-realized masters, these, you know, free souls, they come and, well, they also don't find the property they're looking for. And they also run into obstacles and they also have problems and they also, you know, need to play the play. They're not just going to come and say, oh, I want a seaside hermitage, pum, you know, oh, now I want this amazing little place, pum, you know. They just have to go about it. And mostly, and this is an interesting, they have to go about it for us. Because we have to be involved in all these processes. And so Yogananda is just like looking for a seaside hermitage. And all his disciples are like following around with him. And then they get to find it. And then they get to build it. And for them, what happens to them, the transformation, the flow of grace that allows them to do that, you know, that's really what the Guru is most interested in. Whether it's a seaside ashram, whether it's something else, whether it's just our daily meditations, they just have to kind of put, keep up these appearances so that we also keep putting out energy. And you can see Yogananda would have gone, you know, even when he was looking for his first ashram, just property after property dealing with just, you know, <laughs> these agents who I'm sure were <laughs> trying their very best to wrestle out as much more as you can from them and just go through that whole reality. And sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes it's too expensive, sometimes they don't have the money. I mean, all those things played out. And then inwardly, you know, like at that moment, how many, you know, emotions, even though they were probably no human emotions, but the fact that he, he was going back to that moment when his guru told him, you know, like, like now referring everything back 
to Sri Yukteswar. Like, wow, I mean, everything that you said is happening. And, and, and the satisfaction of sharing that moment with his guru, like, like making him part, like, all this is because of you. I mean, so that, that mental exchange of, of bringing Sri Yukteswar into what was being manifested just through that promise that, I don't know, he saw that vision. And I can only imagine yeah. what that could have been for Master and bring Sri Yukteswar there in that hermitage. Many happy months sped by. In the peace of perfect beauty, I was able to complete at the hermitage a long projected work, Cosmic Chants. So even the Cosmic Chants were written in, in Sinitas. I set to English words and Western musical notation about 40 songs, some original, others my adaptations of ancient melodies, Included were the Shankara chant, No Birth, No Death, two favorites of Sri Yukteswar's, Wake, Yet Wake, O My Saint, and Desire My Great Enemy. The Horary, the Hor, Hori Sanskrit Hymn to Brahma, old Bengali songs, What Lightning Flash, and They Have Heard Thy Name, Tagore's Who Is In My Temple, and a number of my compositions. I will be thine always in the land beyond my dreams. Come out of the silent sky. Listen to my soul call in the temple of silence. And thou art my life. It's nice to hear all these yes, titles that so many of us have, you know, a relationship with many of these chants. And uh, it's nice to kind of contemplate the time that Yogananda was kind of channeling them, composing them, thinking of them, singing them, and all of that happening in this hermitage up till this point. In fact, it is after Encinitas that Yoganandaji really starts uh, putting more energy we into draw, writing. Yeah. He withdraws from a lot more travel and setting up centers. Now, you know, that starts to happen. So many disciples have come up and are taking on so many of the responsibilities for the work. And now he focuses on writing, you know, the autobiography of a yogi, other uh, things. The Gita, of course, was not written here. He still I has a, a desert retreat. The autobiography of a yogi was written there, not at in the, Encinitas. Yeah, at Encinitas, yeah. Um, and so on and so forth. And the cosmic chants, of course, which is such a powerful legacy of Yoganandaji's, this chants that we sing every day. <laughs> For a pre preface to the sound book, I recounted my first outstanding experience with the receptivity of Westerners to the quaintly devotional airs of the East. The occasion had been a public lecture. The time, April 18th, 1926. The place, Carnegie Hall in New York. Mr. Hunsicker, I had confided to an American student I am planning to ask the audience to sing an ancient Hindu chant, O oh God Beautiful. Sir, Mr. Hunsicker had protested, these oriental songs are alien to American understanding. What a shame if the lecture were to be marred by a commentary of overripe tomatoes. I had laughingly disagreed. Music is a universal language. Americans will not fail to feel the soul aspiration in this lofty chant. And we know this chant, it was originally, in fact, a composition by Guru Nanak. Oh God, beautiful, hey Hari Sundar. <clears throat> During the lecture, Mr. Hansiker had sat behind me on the platform, <laughs> probably fearing for my safety. His doubts were groundless. Not only had there been an absence of unwelcome vegetables, but for one hour and 25 minutes, the strains of Oh God Beautiful had sounded uninterruptedly from 3,000 throats. Isn't that beautiful? 3,000 people in that hall chanting Oh God Beautiful for an hour and 25 minutes. Even we don't do it that long. <laughs> Your hearts had soared, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Blase no longer, dear New Yorkers. Your hearts had soared out in a simple pain of rejoicing. Divine healings 
had taken place that evening among the devotees chanting with love the Lord's blessed name. There's another very beautiful part of this. Divine healings took place that day as people were singing. It's a very kind of often not thought of element of the music. And we think of the chanting as, oh, it, you know, it's just okay, it's devotional, it's part of my sadhana, it opens my heart, it allows me to go into meditation more deeply. But uh, there's also a very powerful healing energy to a lot of this music. And sometimes uh, it can be used very, very effectively. It's just singing this, these chants. And perhaps we can try with Oh God Beautiful since yeah. Yogananda Ji here mentions this chant. You know, it led to many healings. But of course, you have to sing it for, you know, you can't just sing it for two, three minutes and say, Kuch ho nahi rahe. <laughs> Where are we in time? Oh, no. maybe that's that it? I guess we should pause here. It's lovely, at a lovely high note of divine healings through this music. We have really only six, seven more pages and hopefully, and we have another chapter if we choose to go into that. There is a beautiful movie, no, not movie, documentary that was made about Yogananda and it's called Awake. And you can see in that documentary this very moment of Yogananda's life, where, where he goes to India, he returns to India for a year and a half, you know, for a pilgrimage and visits all these saints and receives so many blessings. But then when he comes back, he's not the same anymore. Something shifted with him, within um, he received perhaps a different guidance. Now your mission will be different. Your energy should be invested somewhere else. Um, you can see that Yogananda start, started uh, working with more close disciples. You know, like he, his mission somehow, his dharma, I would say, shifted a little bit. And you can see that as well, I mean, the energy of his consciousness now coming back from the from from India, he just kinds of kind of narrows his his energy and, and focus more on on writing and and the disciples also said that they, they had trouble to now relate to Yogananda because they used to approach to him um, in a particular way, but then they noticed that when he came back from India, he was different. He, he couldn't relate anymore. Perhaps at the personal level, they used to. They, they know that, that Yogananda right now was in a different state of consciousness. His eyes were different. His energy was different. So it took them a little while to each one of them also to adjust to this new Yogananda who came from India, perhaps with a different uh, guidance from the divine and from all these saints that he met. And after being in the West for who knows how many years, 20 years, 25 years. Yeah, 15, 20 years yeah. before he went, yeah. then, 15 years. He comes back to the West, but, but you can see that his energy is already shifting and he concentrates his energy a little bit more about communities and, and writings and, and, and chants that will be established in his work and for all of us to disciples to learn. And yeah, it's, it's nice to see that the young Yogananda you know, through now that we are ending the book, the, the young Yogananda visiting all these saints is going to the West and building something. But then he goes back to India and comes back, you know, with a different... Uh, also, his guru has left the body now. His guru has left so the body, yeah. Somehow maybe the true, mantle has been passed yeah, yeah. on to him to now act differently. I mean, who mm. knows? <laughs> this this yeah, divine place. Knows? But yeah, he certainly shifted. In that movie, yeah. all the disciples talk about him just retiring a lot more, secluding a lot more, just going into, as they would say, just going into samadhi for longer periods than he was doing before. Like almost, you know, telling the disciples, I'm not going to tell you anymore what you have to do constantly. You just have to inwardly, intuitively feel what's next for you. And. Anyway, it's a good place for us also to, to think how 
the guru now that he's not in the body anymore, he's constantly guiding us to what's next for us, what, what he's trying to do through us. Well, thank you again for sharing this beautiful book, this beautiful Saturday morning with us. I mm -hmm. uh, wish you a fabulous weekend. Tomorrow we have a great uh, joy and blessing mm -hmm. to have Naya Swami's Jyotishan Devi with us uh, online. <laughs> but uh, Narayani and I will be hosting them in this series that we've been doing, and they've been doing with all our centers in India called In Conversations mm -hmm. with Naya Swami's Jyotishan Devi. Tomorrow's topic is how to stay positive under all circumstances and so we'll have a little conversation with them around that subject but the satsang tomorrow is from 9 mm -hmm. until 10 in the morning because of the time difference with america so i hope that doesn't inconvenience us too much and even if it does a great opportunity to overcome more will and we hope to see you tomorrow oh.